But I feel like inside of the CrossFit space, uh-huh. their whole life is CrossFit. Mm. And I've seen it time and time again where these athletes get hurt in CrossFit and then they don't have anything else outside of CrossFit. So I actually think a lot of CrossFit athletes from what I see actually don't have too many investments outside of like what they're currently doing within CrossFit. They're not investing into real estate or um, they just don't know much about it. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report. Today, we are hanging in the studio here in downtown San Diego, and we got a little sunshine outside. The weather is finally starting to warm up here in San Diego. We've had a bunch of months of consecutive rain and cold weather, so this feels really good to me outside, but I'm very excited because I got a repeat guest. She was on episode 38, and she's an eight-time CrossFit Games athlete. I got Lauren Fisher. Lauren, welcome to the show a second time. Excited to be back here on the show with you, Rich. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Um, We were talking about getting a workout in this morning at Compound. Uh, I was there this morning getting my lift in, and uh, you know, a couple of the, the female girls that work out there, I told them last week, I was like, hey, I might be working out with Lauren Fisher. Uh, next week and they were really excited to meet you because they were like really into the cross game stuff. I'm really bummed that I missed the workout. So we need to make this happen at some point. I was training with my team this morning from eight to 10. So I'm literally in the thick of my CrossFit game season. We just wrapped up our team quarterfinals. We took second in the world and we're getting ready to train or compete here end of May in Carson, California. That's so exciting. And congratulations, by the way. You guys are ripping it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm shocked that you have not worked at a compound. You're local here in San Diego. It's like literally the favorite gym. Like People drive down from L.A. and Orange County on the weekends just to get a day pass there. Did you know that? I did not know this, but I've heard of great things of the compound, and I've been wanting to train <laughs> there, so we're going to make it happen one of these days. Yeah, we'll totally make it happen. So... Uh, You're on a new team now. Uh, Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So last time I was on the podcast, I was actually living in Iceland on Team CrossFit Reykjavik. That's right. That's right. So now I'm actually back home here in San Diego at my home gym, CrossFit Invictus. They just won the title Fittest on Earth last year with the team. So I'm trying to help them defend the title and go for Fittest on Earth again at the CrossFit Games. I love that. Um, So literally in the gym right now, four to six hours a day, five times a week, and just trying to be the best possible athletes we can be and leave nothing in the tank. So when you say four to six hours a day, how many workouts is that? So usually we'll train in the morning, like 8.30 to 11.30, and that's including warm-up, workout, um, accessory work and then we'll come back in the afternoon from like 1 30 to 4 30 and we'll do maybe some lifting gymnastics some cardio work like zone two heart rate and yeah just every day is a grind five times a week and then thursday is kind of our active recovery day so maybe like an hour of just zone two and then i usually like to go get body work do hyperbaric chamber cold plunge sauna recover and get ready for two more hard days of training and then Sunday's a rest day. So this morning, I've never done CrossFit before ever. Uh, And this morning I got a a little taste of it. Um, Not to that same intensity level, but uh, I went in and I was like, hey, I'm going to do legs and shoulders today. And so I was kind of alternating exercises each rep. I would do one set of legs and then I would go do one set of shoulders. And I went back and forth and I was like, dude, my heart rate is way higher than if I was just doing legs or if I was just doing shoulders. Uh, and so I got a little taste of it. I'm like, I can't imagine though what you guys are doing. That's got to be a whole nother level. What is accessory work? So it's funny in CrossFit, we call it accessory work, but it's actually similar to bodybuilding. So, okay. you know, isolation exercises, we're doing like hamstring curls or quad extensions or reverse hypers, Nordic curls. It depends like if we're doing upper body or lower body, but usually we like to finish with accessory work, which is similar to when you go to the gym and you do your bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what we call our accessory work. So maybe like, for example, today I was doing my accessory work and it was upper body strength. So I was doing some push-ups mixed with bicep curls. We don't have access to all of the machines you do at the compound Mm -hmm. because it is a CrossFit gym. I do think one of the most valuable machines though is like the lat pull-down machine. I wish that we had that in the CrossFit gym. I have been hitting a lot more lats over the last couple months. And I got to say, like, it's, it's, I've actually really enjoyed it. Why do you say the lat pull down machine is your fave? So in CrossFit, we do a lot of pull ups, rope climbs, bar muscle ups, ring muscle ups. So if your lats are really strong, then it's going to carry over to those exercises. And for me, like, let, for example, a legless rope climb, that's climbing up a rope without your legs and you need 
like really strong lats for that. So I think if you train lats on the lat pull down machine, it actually carries over to these exercises you do in CrossFit. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So the reason I got more into the lat stuff is because I was working out with someone. He was a, he's a trainer, but he's also a real estate investor. His name is Ben. Shout out to Ben. He lives here in San Diego. Um, I'll work out with someone every now and then. I don't love it all the time um, because I like to go in there and kind of do my own thing and be in my own zone. But I would say once every week or two, I'm down to go lift with someone. Typically, it's got to be on a Wednesday. Uh, but for you, I would make an exception, Lauren. Are but you wearing headphones when you work out? Typically, I do. But since I started working out a compound, they blast music so fucking loud that, like, I don't even have to bring my headphones. Okay. Because I was about to say, if we're working out together, we can't wear headphones. No. No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not at all. We'll, we'll, we'll hang out. We'll get some lifts in. We'll conversate. But that said, Ben was like, he's all, we're doing back and by day. And he is, like, all about the lats. And so he's explaining to me, like, what it does and, like, how it, like, you know, creates these wings on your body. And I was like, you know what? It makes sense. So I started doing more and more exercises on back day, focused on lats. And I've definitely seen some results. And now I'm like into it. I'm digging it. Yeah, it definitely carries over to just squats as well. Like having really strong lats because it makes like your whole core and everything just stronger because you're able to brace better because mm. your lats are connected to your abdominum. So it just connects uh, everything and makes you stronger. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, but that said, uh, yeah, I've really been into the lifting lately. You know, I'm 38 years old right now. And it's now just now at 38, I'm actually learning the value of lifting heavy weights, uh, eating a high protein diet. And um, it's addicting. I stopped, I stopped running probably like four or five years ago because I grew up skateboarding uh, and playing basketball. So I put a lot of wear and tear on my, my legs when I was younger. I used to like jog and stuff like that just for the cardio. But like I, my body would feel sore the next day. So if I ran like six miles right now, my body would feel sore the very next day. Like in, not in a good way. Your joints hurt from running that long. Yeah. And so um, I stopped running probably like four or five years ago. And now I just like lift weights and my body's never felt healthier. It feels good. Lifting weights is so beneficial for everyone, men, women. Like if you're not lifting weights, you definitely need to get into it. Yeah, I totally agree. What age did you start lifting? So I actually had my first personal trainer when I was 10 years old. Really? So I mean, I grew up with three older brothers and I had a personal trainer at University of Pacific UOP in Stockton. And so I'd go with my two brothers and they would, yeah, do superset exercises. I would do a lot of like ladder drills, parachute training. Um, yeah, I was doing it at 10 years old at 10. Wow. And, and were you just always into it day one? I was, I think I was always into it from day one. I feel like my dad ingrained it into me. Yeah. So I was getting paid to do by my dad to do a hundred pushups, a hundred sit-ups every day. So I had this little calendar in our kitchen and I would check off if I did my hundred pushups and 100 sit-ups, and then my dad would pay me at the end of the month for doing all 30 days. Oh, my gosh. And what would you do with that money? I would save it. You would save it? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I wouldn't spend it on anything. I can't even remember what I ended up using the money on, but, yeah, I would save my money. Who, who taught you to save money? My dad. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Did he teach you about investing at all? He also, yeah, big on, my dad is so big on investing, cryptocurrencies, real estate trading, or trading, all of it. So, yeah, he's... The one who like was my go-to before I met my husband would help me with my investments. Yeah, that's interesting. Does your dad, uh, like what did he tell you when you were young about investing into real estate? Because crypto wasn't a thing back then, right? No, crypto wasn't a thing back then. I mean, he didn't talk too much about like, you know, investing back then because I was so young. But like, for example, my dad bought a fixer upper in Sacramento and I would go with him because my dad, uh, so my family had a construction business that was in the Fisher family for over a hundred years. So it got passed down from my grandpa to my dad. So my I just used to my fam family always running their own business. Mm -hmm. So um, my dad had these side projects too, bought a home in Sacramento, went and fixed it up and then ended up renting it out. Um, but that was also though when the real estate market crashed. So it actually turned into not being a great investment for him. But I guess I just kind of learned at a young age, seeing my dad do these things. He had a place in Stockton as well, a rental property and so I guess it just kind of carried over into now uh, me at this age. Would you say that most of your um, competition or maybe some of your teammates in, in the, the space that you compete in, these CrossFit athletes, would you say that a lot of them invest? It's funny because we don't actually ever really talk about these things, but I feel like inside of the CrossFit space, uh -huh. their whole life is CrossFit. Mm. And I've seen it time and time again where these athletes get hurt in CrossFit and then they don't have anything else outside of CrossFit. So I actually think a lot of CrossFit athletes from what I see 
actually don't have too many investments outside of like what they're currently doing within CrossFit. They're not investing into real estate or um, they just don't know much about it. I can kind of relate to that. Remember we were talking before we started recording about going to Fit uh, to work out versus Compound. And I worked out at Fit for a long time before I went to Compound. And what I noticed is people are in less shape at Fit, but uh, there's a lot of like business owners and like people invest and like people are like, doing a lot of other stuff with their money at Fit. So it's more of a conversation there. Um, but the workout component there is not as good. People are, are not in as good a shape, although there are people in good shape, but a lot of people are like, you know, talking shop and chatting. Um, so a lot more conversation there. So I don't feel like I get the same quality of workout there. But then I go to Compound, you get a much better workout. People are a lot more serious. Um, they're definitely like diehard weightlifters in there, but you don't see as many people over there at Compound that are like investing or running businesses and that sort of thing. A lot of them are working more like um, trading their time for money type of positions. Yeah, I think within the CrossFit space too, I mean, we're training so much. We really don't have any energy to do anything but train because you're so exhausted after your training. It's like a full-time job. I mean, you're eating, sleeping, training, recovering. So there's really not much you can do outside of it unless you have a good support team around you. And I've just been lucky that like my husband is able to take care of like the back end of our business and be able to do those things where he's not competing anymore compared to when we were both competing. It was just not sustainable to be able to focus on investments or other things outside of CrossFit because we were constantly exhausted and tired from training. Yeah, I can imagine. But you know, in all reality, I think there's a lot of carryover from like being an athlete um, because, you know, you got a competitive mindset and spirit. You're always competing. You're trying to push yourself to trying to get better. And that transitions over to business and real estate. You know, mm -hmm. I used to play basketball and skateboard, but like growing up and then now in baseball too. And now I'm like, it transitions over to this. I'm very competitive in business because of that, I think. Yeah. And I think too, like the discipline, the time management that you get from like, you know, competing at such a high level carries over to eventually like in business, being an entrepreneur, because you need all of those same traits in order to be the best in your business. You can't just expect to like, just sit back and be like, oh, I'm going to make a turn my business into a million dollar business. You have to work hard day in and day out. The same thing for those who are training at such a high level. Yeah, no, absolutely. What do you think separates the uh, athletes that you compete against? The ones that, because everyone's good at, a, uh, you know, high school and then you get to college level, it's a whole nother level. And then at your level, I mean, these are the best of the best in the world. And so, you know, obviously in order to just to get into that, that arena, you had to be one of the best. Now, the ones that exceed at your level, what do you think separates those from the ones that maybe fall off a little bit or they never actually win? Is it work ethic? Is it like, what do you think it is in your estimation? I think it's work ethic and those small things that make a difference. I think a lot of people aren't able to be held to such high standards where it's like, hey, we're showing up at 8 a.m. We need to be here at this time. And it's not going to be fun. Like you think you would think training in the gym all day would be fun, but it's actually really hard. You're pushing yourself in workouts to like a deep, dark place and going somewhere that other people just don't want to go. And I think that's kind of separates those top 1% from the other 99% because they're willing to sacrifice and work hard day in and day out, even on those days when they're really tired and they don't want to go into the gym. They just, they keep pushing despite like all the obstacles and everything going on in their life. And I mean, it's just those extra 1% that's going to make the difference of winners versus losers. How much of a difference does a, like a really good trainer make? I think a good trainer makes all the difference. I think a lot of people think that they can get somewhere by themselves. But again, it's surrounding yourself by a support team, having a good coach, having a good trainer who understands what are your weaknesses, what are your strengths, like what do you need to work on? You communicate and you can talk to that trainer and be like, hey, this is bo bothering me. What should I do instead? And they're able to kind of like modify things or, you know, um, just make tr make you into a better athlete. I think you that wouldn't be possible if I was like going into the gym and like, okay, let me write up what I'm going to think I need to do. But mm -hmm. I really probably then would just do the stuff that's always fun. But that trainer or that coach is going to make you do things that you don't necessarily want to do because they want to make you better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, like business, you know, I think like I have a business coach, right? We meet every single week. He's going to be flying into town next week to like do like two day quarterly meeting with me and the team. You know, I think in, in business, it helps me tremendously to have a coach. But in your arena, you know, I think coaching is, is huge. 
for you specifically, uh, what kind of coaches do you have? So we have one main coach at our gym who coaches all four Invictus teams. And then also, too, um, we have our captain, Chandler Smith. He actually just took seventh place at the CrossFit Games, so he's technically seventh fittest man on earth. Um, he's also on our team, and he's kind of the one holding us to the account accountability, high standards, like, hey, guys, this is what we're doing tomorrow. We literally have like a full on notes that we're all collabing on. It's like we can see what the week is going to be. Like if someone has like a podcast or something going on, then we need to adjust our training sessions. So he's the person who's holding us accountable. And like tomorrow, we're actually going to have a team meeting basically to go over three things that's going to make us win the CrossFit Games. We need to name three things that each team mem team member needs to get better at three things that I personally need to get better at, and then we're going to all talk about it. What are three things that you need to get better at? I need to consistently get better at my upper body strength, so keep getting that stronger. I need to be better about being on time because mm -hmm. I'm that person who ends up rolling in, you know, five to ten minutes late because I'm always— You were on time for the podcast. I was on time. Yeah. That's a first. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> maybe I'm just lucky. Yeah, maybe you're lucky. But, so, you know, I just—I'm that type of person. I'm like, oh, I'm on time, on, on time, and then all of a sudden I'm not on time mm. anymore. Mm. Um, so upper body strength, being on time, and then uh, just, like, grunt work, like sandbag, cleans, like strongman type stuff. I just need to get stronger, stronger at that because I'm one of the smaller athletes, so that just doesn't come as naturally or as easy to me as it does for other people. Yeah, that makes sense. So it sounds like Chandler is really uh, stepping into a leadership role. Is that 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 right? Yeah. So Chandler, yeah, he's the leader on our team. Yeah. Okay. And then, do you guys have um, like coaches or like uh, dietitians or any anything else outside of like your core group? Yeah. So I actually work with a naturopathic doctor. So I actually just so I just got my blood panels done, okay. and they review your blood panels and basically tell you what you're deficient in, what supplements you need to be taking how you should adjust your nutrition based off of the way like your blood panels look. So for example, I'm actually deficient in vitamin D. Mm. You would think living here in San Diego, I would be completely fine, but apparently I'm not. So um, that's what a naturopathic holistic doctor does. So I usually try to get those done every six months. And I would actually, I feel like that's one of the things that they should make that like mandatory for Americans to do. Um, I feel like it's so beneficial to be able to see your blood panels and it tells you a lot about how healthy you are. Yeah, no, absolutely. What else did you find out with the blood panels? Uh, Do they test your T levels? They test my testosterone levels. What's normal testosterone level for a woman? So I can't give you like numbers off the top of my head. Because for a man, it's like, I think normal range is like 350, 400 would be like kind of low end to like maybe 800. That's kind of considered normal. Yeah. And I know a lot of guys that that I know personally that go on the test and they try to like run around 900 to 1,000. And that's this is high. this is monitored. Yeah. And they they feel like that's their doctors tell them like that's that's like where they should be if they're trying to grow. Yeah. The funny thing is though, I've actually noticed that a lot of CrossFit athletes who are men have low testosterone. Really? So, yeah, just, like, based off previous history, like, when, like, my brother was getting his blood panels done, when my husband was getting his blood panels done. Where do they test at? Do you remember? I think it was, like, 350 or 400. Mm. So I got a question for you, though, on that. So I feel like a lot of my buddies that go and get tested at these, like, testosterone clinics, for whatever reason, like, it always comes in low. Do you think it's because they're trying to, like, get them on it? And they're like, oh, you're, like, 350, like, I suggest you start taking the test. So there's specific clinics that they only test testosterone? And they don't, yeah. Well, these are like specific clinics to where they try to sell them on getting on it. I think maybe that could be a little bit sketchy. But what like my husband and brother were doing, they were working with a holistic doctor. I don't Got think it. they would want to have them take anything that they shouldn't be taking. There was no alignment of interest for the levels to come in low. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> with real estate investing, asset protection and protecting yourself from personal liability is huge. The best way to address this is to correctly set up your LLCs and entity structure. For us at Summers Capital, we use prime corporate services to set up, manage and provide guidance for all of our entities, making it truly hands off. If you want to learn more, visit Prime Corporate Services slash Rich Summers to book a free call and receive a special podcast listener offer. Again, visit primecorporateservices.com slash Rich Summers to book a free call. Now back to the show. So I wonder why um, a lot of these male CrossFit athletes are like coming in with low T levels. You would think the otherwise. I, I think it's the amount of training that we do. It's tech. I mean, 
we're just training so much that your body is constantly breaking down and mm. recovering. But one of the things is obviously as a competition comes up, then you lower the volume, you try to keep the intensity higher. So you go into the competition, we're feeling really fit. Like you're really strong. You're really like, you just can push really hard and workouts go really fast. And that's kind of the whole goal of the CrossFit Games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there a lot of women like bodybuilders or CrossFit athletes that take testosterone? Not in CrossFit because it would be banned. So we get drug tested um, randomly. Uh, I have to submit my whereabouts every quarter, like where I'm going to be because they can randomly show up at my door and drug test you. How often do you get like randomed? I haven't got randomly drug tested in a while, but actually when I was in USA lifting, when I used to compete in that, I would get probably drug tested like every six months and also in a competition. So here in the end of May, like we'll all get drug tested after the competition. So usually whoever finishes on the podium gets drug tested and then maybe like fourth and fifth place also get drug tested. Does anyone ever like finish high and get on the podium and then they get popped? Yeah, there was one of the guys at the CrossFit Games. Uh, his name was uh, Ricky Garrard. He ended up popping for PEDs, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I might be getting this wrong. But anyways, he got popped and uh, he ended up basically getting banned for four years. And then now he's back, though, competing and he's crushing it. Um, I think he learned his lesson. So it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I wonder, like, how long how long that stuff takes to get out of your body? Because, like, you know, if you're taking a drug test yeah. for marijuana or all this other stuff, you can take something that will basically mask it. Is there any of that stuff in, in with testosterone testing? I wouldn't know yeah. because I don't know too much about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because some, some sports allow it, some sports don't. Like, I had uh, DJ Young on recently, and he's a professional pickleball player. And he's professional like, pickleball, that's a thing now? Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay, I didn't know and that was a thing. And he's like one of the top ranked pickleball players. And he's like, dude, they don't freaking test it for PEDs at all. And wow. so he's like, some of the guys are like, they're juiced up. And I'm like, okay, well, then if that's the case, then it's hard for the ones that are not on it to compete if it's legal. Does that make a difference in pickleball though? I think it does because like it's quickness, it's like strength and, and endurance, like all that stuff matters. So I'm sure that, I'm sure it's got to give you a little bit of an edge. Yeah. Can't argue that, right? That is true. But it probably matters less in pickleball than it does like bodybuilding or what you're doing. Yeah. No, I think in CrossFit, if that would make a huge difference if you were actually taking that. Yeah, absolutely. Now in the off season, some some folks probably I imagine take it, right? You still cannot take it in the off really? season because you'll get drug tested. I submit if you want to be part of like the CrossFit game season, mm -hmm. like you're submitting your whereabouts even in the off season. And also you have off season competitions. So like we have these big competitions in Dubai, Miami, um, and they drug test you at these competitions. That's crazy. So when you submit your whereabout, what are you telling them? Basically, I put where's my home location okay. and then where am I going to be outside of those dates, like where I'm not going to be at home. So if I'm making a trip or traveling, then I have to put I'm going to Nicaragua this week or whatever. And then like they basically know, OK, if they want to come drug test me, they're going to have to go to Nicaragua or wherever I'm at. In the that's world. crazy. So that's testosterone. Um, what what um, like natural things are you guys taking? Like creatine? What Talk about some of the supplements that you're taking. So I take creatine, beta alanine. What's that? I feel like so beta alanine buffers lactic acid buildup. So when you're doing like bike sprints in the middle of a workout, you know, that tingling feeling you get. Have you ever taken beta alanine? Never have. Okay. You need to try it out. But it'll like some people like you just get so tingly in like the head and like your hands and everywhere. And it's supposed to help buffer lactic acid. And mm. Matt Frazier, who was five time fittest man on earth, he used to call it like his second lung. Like he used really? to be able to breathe better by taking beta alanine. Um, and then there's creatine, which I think is so beneficial for not even just athletes to take because it helps brain health. Um, it boosts lean muscle mass. Like it's so great creatine. I just started taking that like, um, not that long ago. And I've noticed like a, a big difference. Yeah. In just a lot of different things. Five grams daily yes. can be like a game changer. The one thing I'm not good at though with it is, is if I'm, if I'm working out that day, I take it. I just like before I go to the gym, I take it. And then it's a like clockwork. But if I'm not working out, it's like an off day. I completely forget. Just take it first thing in the morning. That's usually morning. what I do. Okay. Just like first thing in the morning, take my scoop of creatine. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. I think a lot of too misconception 
about taking creatine with women. A lot of women feel like they're going to get bulky or too muscular by taking creatine. And I think that's like so far from the truth. I used to be one of those girls who was scared to take creatine. Really? I'm like, oh, I'm going to get so bulky and big. But it actually, I feel like for a lot of those girls who want to get toned, yeah. they want to get lean. It'll all actually help with that. I think a big men's misconception with a lot of women is they don't even want to like start lifting weights because they think they're going to get buff. That is true. That's another misconception is they're scared to lift weights, but actually lifting weights boosts your metabolism. Burn helps, more calories. Burns more calories, makes you leaner, makes you more toned. And like, I know like a lot of women, they want to like, you know, get those toned arms or, you know, have like a bigger butt or like toned legs. And by lifting weights, it's actually going to help you. And I, it is also so great for our joints and for your overall health. I think like there should be no reason why any woman is scared to lift weights. I agree. I, I think 90% of women could get in there and lift heavy weights consistently and they're never going to get like super buff. It just, just like and a, it also depends too, like what is your nutrition like? Mm -hmm. How much are you training? Like by going and lifting and following a proper program, you're you're not going to get super buff. I think they are scared because they see maybe like some athletes, some female athletes who are really buff and bulky. But that just also comes down to genetics. And I think, yeah, you're I think women just should not be scared to go and lift weights. Yeah. And as a guy like now that I'm working on a compound, I'm around a lot of these women that lift weights. And as a guy, I'm a single guy, right? I'm a bachelor I live in here in San Diego. Now that I'm around women that lift weights, I don't think I could date a woman that like doesn't lift weights. I just, I don't know. And like, I'm into it. Their bodies just look a lot healthier and cleaner. And I'm just more attracted to a woman that actually lifts weights. Yeah. I think, I mean, what do they say? Gym couples that lift together, stay together. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I <laughs> yeah. like that. I like that. So maybe I'll have to do some dating in the gym, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's also where you're going to find people who are into health and fitness and you're going to have similar interests compared to finding someone who, I mean, it's fine to go drink and party and all of that, but that's not like their full on lifestyle. They also like to reel it in during the week and train. I think that's definitely something that makes them more attractive. Totally. I think balance is key. Like for me, I think like I believe in like the 80, 20 rule. So 80% of the time I try to be like eat pretty clean, go to the gym, work out. And then 20% of the time, it's like, whatever, you got to enjoy a little bit. Um, otherwise for me, I'll go crazy. If I just don't do anything, but like lift and eat clean, I'll go crazy. Right. That is true. Um, that's me though. Right. Yeah. And that's what works for me. And the beauty is like, everyone has something that should work for them. Theoretically, the women though, that are really buff in like veins popping out that are like hardcore bodybuilders, they're likely on testosterone, right? They're most likely on taking something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you see those women, you're like, okay, they got to be on something, at least when I see it. But uh, no, it's interesting. Yeah, no, yeah. that is interesting. Not something I know so much about just because in CrossFit, we don't take drugs. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so do you guys ever have men, because this has happened in other sports, like track, for example, there has been men that uh, transition over to women and they compete and end up, you know, winning some competitions in, in that space. Have you guys ever had something similar in the, in the CrossFit arena? There has been one man that I know that has transitioned to a woman. Um, she competed in the master's category of CrossFit. And, and what was this man doing uh, or this woman doing before tr transitioning? So she had actually, tr he had tried to qualify for the Olympics, mm -hmm. didn't make it, I believe, and then switched over to a woman and then tried to qualify for the Olympics in swimming and didn't make it. And then she found CrossFit. I actually don't even know if she's still competing in CrossFit, but we used to, she used to train at the gym I was at like a few years ago. She was one of the nicest people, but she was so strong. Like I just remember one of the days the guys were deadlifting over probably around 350, 400 pounds. And then she walked in, didn't warm up and was able to go and deadlift the bar. She was just like crazy strong. Wow. 400 pounds deadlift. No big yeah. deal. Yeah. That's crazy. What do you deadlift? My max deadlift is 380 and I weigh like 140. And so what are the other like woman athlete, like how do they kind of feel about this? I don't think anyone felt intimidated or scared in the CrossFit gym mm. because I mean, at the end of the day, like for example, I was able to do better. And so it was never really anything and she was really nice and everything. But I do think for example, if there was someone that came in who had transitioned to uh, from a man to a female and, you know, was beating me in workouts and taking my spot, for example, on the team, 
uh, that would definitely cause a little bit of frustration because obviously it's just harder when you're in, for example, just I'm not blessed with those certain genetics that you're born with. Yeah, I have no problem with like someone transitioning from a male to a woman or a woman to a male. I think it's like your body, you do what you want with it. Exactly. However, if I had kids and I had a daughter or I had a spouse or a girlfriend that was competing and she lost out in the last spot on the team or lost out to winning uh, a competition to someone that was a man prior, I would have a problem with that. Yeah. No, I definitely, like, I 100% agree with you. Like, I don't mind the transition of men to female. If that's what you want to do, it's your body. But I do think there needs to be some sort of, like, transgender division. Um, and then obviously keep the men division, keep the female division, and then they can have their own division. Because I do think at the end of the day, it's just... There is a certain level, like you're just your bone structure and just the way you were born, like is much like just different than females. And I just don't think we'll ever be able to compete no matter like what the process is they go through. I just think it is going to make it a lot harder for us as women to be able to compete in our sport. And I do agree with you. If I had a daughter, I wouldn't. I will just it would be really sad for me to see that, like yeah. if she got her spot taken on the team. Yeah, from- no, Absolutely. So uh, I want to switch gears here. So you're doing a lot of cool retreats with uh, Grown Strong. And um, I see you going to Bali and you're going to Denmark here uh, in a couple months. Um, Tell me about these retreats. What do you guys do? Yeah, so we have five fitness retreats coming up. We're going to Denmark, Bali, Nicaragua here at the end of 2024. And then Thailand and Cape Town beginning of 2025. Cape Town. Yeah, basically we want to give you like the ultimate fitness getaway. So... If you love working out, eating good food, exploring, meeting like-minded people, like these retreats are for you. And we, Rasmus, my husband and I, we plan these vacations exactly how we would like to travel. We feel like if we work out at the beginning of the day, it makes us feel better. If we're eating all these good food, for example, in Denmark, we're going to be doing like a Danish pastry making class one day. So we'll work out in the morning. And then we'll go do our Danish pastry making class where you get to eat all the Danish pastries after. Um, And then we'll go like explore Tivoli, which is one of like the oldest amusement parks in Europe, um, which is really fun. So we just want to make we want to give people the ultimate experience where they feel like they were able to explore the local culture and also get some good workouts in and eat some good food and hang out with fun people. Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys get a lot of repeat um, folks or is it typically new folks? Repeat. It's actually pretty crazy. So one of the girls who's basically gone on every fitness retreat with us since 2018. She actually just signed up for Denmark in August. She signed up for Thailand in January and Cape Town in February. So she's coming on three retreats with us. Yo. Um, and then last year in Nicaragua, so we capped the retreats at 20 people. 14 of the 20 people were returning participants. So it's actually pretty cool because now then all these people are like, because they're all friends. So they're like, hey, which retreat are you mm. going to go on? Because they want to reconnect because they're all not living in the same places. So it's like, I know a lot of them want to come to Cape Town together. So we do see like a lot of returning people coming back for now. They're like third or fourth, fourth retreat, which is pretty cool. And that's going to be cool for you to see. I mean, you created this community and for you to see them really like connecting and becoming best friends with each other, that's got to be powerful for you, right? Yeah. I, I think that's like one of the coolest things. And then now seeing too, people are like our bridesmaids in their weddings or like maid of honor. Like we had this one girl who signed up for a double occupancy with a random roommate. Uh And so she met this girl from Australia. They never knew each other, became best friends from this week. And then now they're like best friends. They talk to each other all the time. Karen lives in Australia. Rachel lives in South Carolina. And they were just in each other's weddings. No way. That's so cool. Yeah. I love that. I'm really interested in the Bali one and, and uh, the Cape Town. I might be down to come. There's still some spots available, and I think I'll give you a special discount. Anyone who's listening, also a special discount oh, to join okay. the retreats if they want to join. Okay, if any of the listeners want to learn more about this retreat, where can they go? They can go to retreats.grownstrong.com. I love that. I love that. So um, you're doing all this stuff with Grown Strong. What are you most like looking forward to for the rest of this year? I know you're competing, and you got a lot of your focus on that right now. But in the grown strong arena, what are, you, what are you most excited for? I'm most excited to just be able to focus on my just the business outside of like the CrossFit game. So after August, just all the travel I have ahead and kind of 
this is our first time. We've only ever come out with two retreats a year. And now all of a sudden we launched five retreats. So yeah. for us, I think that's really exciting to see that people are really interested in it. And so um, my husband and I are thinking about potentially, you know, making this like a full fledged thing with the retreats. We feel like this can really be its own thing. Uh, turning this into like a full business rather than like kind of a side hobby for us. Yeah, I love that. We just hosted our first retreat for our mastermind down in Cabo San Lucas. And there's a lot of work that goes into planning these retreats, right? It's like, you know, you're planning the excursions and the accommodations and like everything to a T, the dinners and all that. Is that aspect, like, how do you guys treat the, all the planning? Because that's a lot of work that goes into it. There is a lot of planning that goes into it, and we're lucky to have local contacts mm. in kind of each of the countries. And so funny enough, one of the guys who came on our last retreat in Bali, he was from Cape Town, South Africa. No way. So he's like, if you guys ever want to plan a retreat in Cape Town, I can help you guys. Got so it. now like we have this connection in Cape Town. So he's showing us all the best restaurants. We were like, what do you think about this safari? And he's like, that's like a zoo. You don't want to go there. So it's just like to be able to have these like local connections makes a difference in the planning. So for our Bali retreat, we have a local guy there, Naloom. And he's like one of the nicest guys. That's actually one thing about Bali. The people there are so nice. Really? Uh, and that's like, they're just like so helpful and so kind. Um, and anyways, we have this local guy in Bali. And so he's been like helping us, showing us like all these cool places you like wouldn't necessarily think about going. Because usually if you're like looking online on Google, you just go to all the tourist spots. Totally. Hey guys, real quick, the only way this show grows, the only way we continue to bring on bigger and better guests is if you guys rate, review, and share the show. So if you could take two seconds or the click of the thumb to review on Apple or Spotify, it will mean the world to me. But more importantly, we'll be able to reach more entrepreneurs and more real estate investors and help them build wealth through this podcast. Now back to the show. Yeah, I've never been to Bali. I've always wanted to go. And then uh, Cape Town would be really cool. I didn't realize till recently you go to Cape Town and then if you just fly a couple hours north, they have a lot of like African safaris down there where you can do like three, five, seven day safaris and go see all the exotic animals that are in that part of the world. I would love to kind of parlay a Cape Town trip with a safari trip and just like knock it all out and, and really see, soak it in. You can do that. Our Cape Town trip is actually really cool because we'll do a full day like wine tasting on this like wine tram. So that'll be like a full day trip in itself. So we'll work out in the morning and then we're going to go wine tasting in the afternoon. I'm I sure, love wine. I'm sure people will get smashed on that trip <laughs> on the wine tasting, but everyone absolutely has so much fun. And then, yeah, you can do a trip outside of the retreat and go to Kruger National Park, which is supposed to be like incredible with the yes, animals. That's the one. Yeah. And I also, we're going to stay a little bit longer and we're, we want to go shark cage diving. Whoa, that would be really yeah. badass. That would be <laughs> so cool. Okay. So the wine tasting, is that is that something you guys try to do on all your uh, trips or is that just the Cape Town? It depends on the trip. So wherever we're going, but Cape Town, I mean, they're known for their, there's this full like wine area and Rasmus and I love drinking wine. Love so that. again, we would want to do anything on the trip that's going to be fun for us as well. So we're really looking forward to that. In Nicaragua, we do like a cocktail making class for one of like our days. So it's like tacos and cocktails and we make our own like guac, tacos wow. and cocktails. Um, in Bali, I do not think that we have like an alcoholic excursion on that trip. Again, it depends on where you're going in the world and kind of what they're known for. And for example, we went to Barcelona and we did this uh, like champagne uh, it was like a sparkling champagne slash wine drink that we did tasting. And that was really cool. What's your favorite wine? What's my favorite wine? Uh, I love Cabernet Sauvignon. Is that pronounced correctly? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. So you're a cab girl. Yeah. Uh, you don't do any whites? I do do whites. Okay. What kind of whites do you like? Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like, um, if I do white, I like Savi B, a little Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and then reds, right now I'm, I'm kind of on a red kick. Um, I've been drinking a lot of Pinot Noir. Okay, yeah. I like Pinot. Yeah, Pinot's yeah. good. I feel like it's easy. Yeah. You know, but I can do a blend um, as well. And fun fact, um, we got a little office dog here, uh, Alex's uh, Boston Terrier. His name is Pinot. Oh, really? After Pinot Noir, That's yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's I've funny. never heard someone name their dog after a wine. Yeah, he's like the chillest dog ever too. He just like literally sleeps all day. Sometimes I'll be here like, six hours and I'm like, oh my gosh, Pino's been here all day. Like I haven't even <laughs> heard a peep. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. He's just, he's very chill, but, uh, -huh. uh no, that's cool. I, I'm a big wine fan as well. And I just think it, it's easy. It goes with everything, goes with food very well. 
And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's easier to drink. I don't, I don't do the beer anymore. I used to do beer when I was younger. Um, I used to love like IPAs. And before that, when I was in college, I used to love like Bud Light, Coors Light, Naughty Light and all that sort of stuff. But now I'm like, I can't drink any of that stuff. It's just feeling, give me a nice glass of wine and I'm a happy camper. I've never been a beer girl, but have you been to Guadalupe Valley? Love Valle de Guadalupe. Yeah. Yes. I want to I wanna go back. I, it's been forever. I haven't been in like probably three years, but I, I'm due for a trip. But the food and wine there is incredible. Yes. And it's so close to San Diego. There's like 100 plus wineries there and it's two hour drive from San Diego. I honestly rather go there than go to Temecula for wine tasting. Oh, it's not even close. Yeah. Yeah. And there's drivers that um, will pick you up here in San Diego at your home and they will drive. They speak fluent English, fluent um um, Spanish and they have dual citizenship and they will drive you all the way down there. Once you get south of the border, they'll let you drink in the car and they'll take you down to all the wineries and they'll drive you around. And at the end of the day, they'll bring you back to San Diego. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, it's That's a thing. Cool. It's a thing. I've done it before where we even like, they drove us around, dropped us off at our hotel at the end of the day, stayed a night and then picked us up the next day and then take us back. That's so, cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. <laughs> so it's not bad. <laughs> But I need to go. It's been like three years. Yeah, we just went over the New Year's. Yeah. Um, that was really fun. What's your favorite winery down there? I can't even remember the names. I We went to a few different wineries this time, but I've gone two times. So we went back in like 2021 and then recently, but I can't remember the name of the winery. Yeah, Valle de Guadalupe, Mexico is like, it's it's new. It's uh, vibrant. I mean, it's really just been, it hit the scene maybe less than 10 years ago, but it's really the last three or four years to where it started to get a lot of momentum, but I think most folks that are not from San Diego don't even know about it, right? Well, 100 plus wineries, big valley, inland from Ensenada. You can even stay in Ensenada right on the water and then go uh, hit the wineries. It's like a 15 minute drive during the day, but stay at night right in Ensenada if you wanted to. But you know, there's so many Airbnbs that popped up there, mm -hmm. really nice boutique hotels that popped up. Um, really good restaurants too. King of Queen Cantina here in, in uh, Lit Italy. They're there. Yeah. 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 Um, my man Jorge, who actually uh, owns uh, King Queen, man, he's been blowing up. He's got all these freaking restaurants all over, but this was like his second one. Oh, really? And I remember meeting him like four or five years ago. Now this is probably 2017. And I think this was his second location and he was living here at Ariel. And now he's got like 10 locations all over, but one of them's in Valle. And it's really good. Have you been I, there? I wanted to go there, but we didn't end <laughs> yeah, up going. No. Yeah. Okay. So there's a really good one, uh, a good winery. It's called Cuatro Cuatros. I've been to that one. Yeah. It's really good, like uh, ambiance, right? Yeah. Right on the water and right on a cliff, like overlooking the water. Best sunsets, good vibe, and like just good music and good people. Um, I like that one too. Yeah. The yeah. food is incredible. Yeah. But yeah, for any listeners out there that have not been to Valle de Guadalupe, Mexico, Check it out. Um, I think you could probably fly into San Diego and then make a little trip down there. Um, all good vibes. I think two days down there is perfect. You're talking Temecula. I'm like, no, this not blows, even close. This blows Temecula out of the water. And Temecula I think is so it, expensive too. Yeah, I think it blows Napa out of the water. Yeah, Sonoma, all that stuff. No, this is this is the this is the new stuff right here. Mm -hmm. So uh, check it out. I need to go down there for a trip. So speaking of trips, are you just doing the retreats right now, or are you going to do some personal trips? Just. The retreats plan, I mean, since we're going traveling August, October, December, um, we do have like my brother's wedding in Nicaragua actually at our family home over there. So, but then obviously we're combining that with our retreat in Nicaragua. Um, we're going to make a trip to Denmark to visit my husband's family. And then we potentially talked about since like Thailand is very close to uh, Vietnam, we've always wanted to travel there and we also wanted to go to Singapore. So Ooh, we were like- cool. Because we're going to travel from Thailand to Cape Town because we want to make longer trips. So we're like, maybe we'll stop in Vietnam for like a week and then go to Singapore and then travel to Cape Town. Because it's yeah. like kind of on the way. Yeah. I was looking. I love that. And your husband's name is Raz. Yeah. It's funny because my one of my best friends, his name is Raz. Really? And I don't know anyone else named Raz. Now, my buddy, his name is Brandon. Last name is Razlowski. And so we just always call him, we always call him Raz, like yeah. short for Razlowski. And so that's kind of funny. But uh, so Raz is from uh, Denmark. Denmark. Okay. And you showed me before we started recording, he's renovating a property out there. Yeah. So we just bought an apartment in his hometown, Onsa, Denmark, uh, right in the middle of the city, uh, which is super nice. And yeah, we're he's over there actually right now renovating that because it's a complete demo fixer. Um, usually you would find like apartments in the city to be a lot more expensive. But since it was a demo, like uh -huh. Ross is like it was a really good deal. And we've been wanting to get something in Denmark. 
Um, and this is kind of our good way for us to get like into the system. So we actually went half and half on it with his parents because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to get it because Rasmus hasn't been in Denmark for 10 years. So it's our way to kind of get our name back in the system. So if we ever want to buy a property in Denmark, then like we have this history with kind of Denmark, how yeah. it works. It's just all, it's different over there. Absolutely. So uh, you said it's an apartment. Yeah. Is it, tell me a little bit more about what it is. It's just a one bedroom, one bath apartment. Um, just really cute and in a cute town. There's cafes and coffee shops and the plan is to fix it up. We talked about either renting it or potentially putting it on Airbnb, like and leaving it open for whenever we want to travel there. Um, but it is, they have way more strict Airbnb regulations over there. And I think there's only a certain amount of days that you can like put it on Airbnb. So that's kind of the only downside. So we'll kind of see, we need to, once it's finished, we'll figure out like whether or not we're going to rent it or put on Airbnb. Yeah, absolutely. And you guys got um, your investments out here in San Diego. You have a triplex, yeah. I believe, right? We have our triplex here. Are you in still living there? So actually, at the moment, we aren't living there. We're fully renting it out just because of, like, the rent that we can get in turn. Like, yeah. we don't need to live in our three-bedroom, two-bath home. Like, it's way too big for us. Mm -hmm. So just in something a little bit smaller right now, fully renting that out. And the goal is to get potentially another duplex or triplex here in San Diego. We just want to keep building our real estate portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually, I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at selling a couple of small apartment buildings that I have in Cincinnati. Um, I've had them for a little bit now and just like, you know what, I want to move it. I want to move that equity into something in San Diego. I'm bullish on this market, something local that my team can manage. And, uh, for, I was looking at some stuff. I'm actually going to go look at a property tonight. It's a four bed, four bath in, uh, Mission Hills. I and, love Mission Hills. Yeah. There's still like a few short term rental licenses left at the, with the city of San Diego. And so, um, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's like literally... Uh, three stories with like a rooftop deck. It's got uh, a little bit of bay views and a little bit of downtown skyline views. And I was kind of browsing the MLS last night and I was like, oh my gosh, uh, the listing agent is actually one of my buddies who's been on the podcast, Seth. Shout out to Seth. And so I'm going to go take a look at it tonight and uh, maybe tie this thing up. So we'll see. And it's going to come furnished and everything. So I'm like, it's almost meant to be. Yeah. But for me, I'm like, the rate environment's high. So it's hard to find any cash flow right now. But for me, I would just like want to park this equity here. I don't even care if I break even, right? Even if I lose a couple hundred dollars a month, I don't care um, because I want to hold this thing 10, 15, 20 years. And I know over time it will start cash flowing, especially when the rates go back down, I can refi. But over time, this the long-term appreciation is, is going to make me a lot of money. Exactly. You know, where in, in Cincinnati, I'm not going to get that. No one wants to live in Cincinnati. No, no. <laughs> You know, and so I don't know, those deals served me well. Like my first deal was an 11 unit apartment building in Cincinnati. I bought it for $350,000. Wow. Yeah, crazy, right? C That's class. Crazy. But um, it served me well. It kind of got me like my feet wet in the game. But, you know, that property is never going to be worth $3 million, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I know if I roll that into something out here, um, one day that property will be worth three or four million. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So kind of change of perspective, you know? No, I agree. San Diego is, I feel like the place to be and everyone wants to move here just with the weather and everything that they're building out. I mean, they're constantly building. I mean, in Chula Vista, I feel like, or my brother was saying they're building out the new like uh, apartment building over there or something. And so I just feel like San Diego is the place to be. It is the place to be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's on an island too, you know, like to the north. You got the Mexican border to the west. You got the Pacific Ocean to the south. You got, um, did I say the north? You have the Mexican border? No, <laughs> I'm all twisted. I thought today was Tuesday. I walked into Starbucks on the way into the office this morning after the gym. And I told everyone at Starbucks, I go in there every single morning. And so they all know me. I'm like, hey guys, happy Tuesday. Have a wonderful Tuesday. And then I come out and I jump on a call with Seth. And I'm like, happy Tuesday, bro. He's like, dude, it's Wednesday. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know <laughs> what day it is. Day of the yeah. days of the week. Yeah. I feel like I'm also that way sometimes. I guess it, yeah, I guess it just means I'm busy. I don't know. Yeah. But anyways, um, so to the north, you got Camp Pendleton. To the west, you got the Pacific Ocean. To the south, you got the Mexican border. And then to the east, you got the mountain ranges. So from like a supply standpoint, there's really not a land, a lot of land to build on. And, um, you know, actually there's a report that Marcus and Millichap puts out on the multifamily like housing forecast. And they, they rank San Diego as I think the number two market in the entire country. Oh, wow. Yeah, in terms of like forecast. So like, that's pretty cool. It's that's powerful. really cool. Yeah. So you guys do the long-term rent with your triplex? Long-term rent. So yeah. I just, 
we don't have the time right now to do short-term rentals. Otherwise, we would need to hire out someone. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of headaches. Yeah. And we have really good renters right now. We've been really lucky, lucky with our renters. So we just don't really deal with the short-term right now. Yeah, I don't blame you. Um, I got a question for you. So I'm curious because now that I'm into lifting and all that sort of thing, I'm curious, like, what's your PR or personal record for, uh, like, different exercises? You ready? Yeah. Okay. So how about uh, how about squat? 300 pounds. Okay. Uh, what about deadlift? 380. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> that is really impressive. And what about uh, bench press, flat bar? 175. That's one of my weaker lifts. 175? That's yeah. still impressive. Most of the girls I compete against are over 200 pounds. Oof, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay. What's another popular one that you guys do? Clean and jerk. Yeah, clean and jerk. 245 pounds. We also snatch. So the one where you like do it in one movement. Mm -hmm. um, my max snatch is 190 pounds. Wow. And then front squat. So that's where you squat in the front rack. That's 265. That's impressive. Also the one where you just literally like jerk the weight overhead. Mm -hmm. 270. That's insane. So with the front squat, what's the benefit of that one? Front squat, so build your strength up for cleans. So the squat clean, power cleans, basically that's why you want a front squat because it makes you stronger in the front rack position. It actually trains um, everything a little bit differently and also really engages your abs. Mm. Um, and that front rack is a lot harder than, for example, if you're doing like back squats. Can you get lower with the front squat than the back squat? So in CrossFit, we always have to get below below parallel, which is below your knees, like with your butt. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Yeah. How many pull-ups can you do? I can probably do 20 strict pull-ups. What's a Just strict Just like pull a normal pull-up. I think that's what you're talking about. But yeah. like, for example, in CrossFit, we do kipping pull-ups. Okay, where, what's that? And a lot of people like hate on our kipping pull-ups. It's basically where you are kind of like in this butterfly motion, you're doing pull-ups and I can do around 50 in a row. 50? Yeah. Wow. And strict is just like flat bar yeah. this way and you're just doing, yeah. okay, you could do 20 of those. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we got to get a lift in a compound. I know. We just, we need to make it happen. We need to make it happen. So um, you're in town now for a while. I'm there like four or five days a week. I'm flexible. So you let me know when yeah. and uh, we'll go get a lift in. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Cool. Well, I appreciate you hanging out for the second time, Lauren. Uh, where can listeners get in touch with you if they want to learn more? They can go to my Instagram at Lauren Fisher or my website, lauren-fisher.com. They can check out uh, more about Grown Strong at grownstrong.com. I have an online fitness community for women, so an online fitness program they can sign up for. And then Grown Strong Retreats, retreats.grownstrong.com. We'll make sure or I'll make sure to give some discounts so you can tag them. Oh, watch the out. There we go. Links below. Listeners, there it is. Well, keep crushing it. I'm a fan, and uh, I know you're going to keep crushing it in these uh, CrossFit games. So stoked for you, and uh, we got to get a lift in. Compound, we're making it happen. Yeah. She's Lauren Fisher. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>